I'm going to start the lecture here. Um, uh, if, if anybody is listening online, and I, 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 we can't detect whether there are people listening online, but I'm going to start the lecture nonetheless. Um, uh, just in terms of um, tonight's talk, uh, I'm going to be dealing with uh, future trends in science and engineering. And um, the, the key themes are the urban century and the fourth industrial revolution. So the urban century will involve a doubling in size of the world's uh, global uh, um, cities. So it will increase in population from 3.5 billion to 7 billion. The fourth industrial revolution will involve um, an expansion of um, uh, intelligent infrastructure in terms of sensor technology and digitization of civil engineering, transport systems and production systems. So uh, these will present obviously challenges and opportunities for engineers in the future. Uh, just in terms of uh, thinking about urbanization and industrialization, um, it's, it's all really happened before. Uh, and this would really reflect the West's history in terms of uh, how the West developed North America, the Atlantic region, Europe. It was the invention of the steam engine by, in Britain in the, uh, the late 18th century, which drove developments in um, industrialization as labor was mechanized and also led to um, uh, developments in transport in terms of steam engine trains and steam engine ships, which further drove mass migration of European peoples around the world, particularly to cities like New York. And uh, New York is a very good example of this urbanization, industrialization link. Um, the population of New York in 1820 was one, 150,000 people. By 1920, it increased to 5.3 million people. So this drove a need for high-rise developments uh, long uh, need for long bridge structures to um, to span natural boundaries such as the Hudson and the East Rivers, uh, connecting Manhattan with the island with the outer uh, boroughs of New York. So uh, there was a, there was a key relationship between urbanization and industrialization. The the demand for high density um, skyscrapers uh, and high density urban area uh, drove developments in uh, electrical engineering and chemical engineering to produce much stronger steel and uh, larger girders, which enabled construction of these uh, novel types of skyscrapers and long bridge structures, which further drove urbanization uh, as, as more and more people were attracted towards cities like New York, which, which, which I suppose were places of, of potential opportunity and employment and huge migration, obviously, from Western Europe to the United States. Uh, just in terms of what's, what's, what's happened since all this development, well, since the 1960s, we've seen a shift of the global economic center east towards uh, China, Japan, and the, uh, the Asian tiger economies. I suppose this was inevitable in a way, but, but I suppose there is an underlying message that we may have lost our technological edge in the West as, as this economic power has shifted east, and it probably illustrates the, the fact that economic development is fundamentally linked with science and technology. We may have forgotten that in the West over the, the, the last number of decades, as the financial services, uh, media, and uh, uh, other, other sectors have, have come to dominate our economies. Uh, just in terms of looking to the future, well, as I mentioned, we're, we're looking at 7 billion people in cities by 2060, 2070, based on the UN 2011 report. And there's going to be a fourth industrial revolution as I said, intelligent control of energy use and traffic within cities to enable uh, 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 the avoidance of delays within cities and also um, optimization of energy use. In terms of intelligent production, we're looking at shorter business cycles, mass markets in these huge urban areas, and uh, competitiveness will be key in terms of energy and other inputs. So we're moving towards zero defects production based on dynamic networks of control of the production system which will enable complete and utter cost savings in terms of inputs and also linking to consumer markets. That intelligence will be fed back into the production system, enabling lean or flexible production, delivering products that customers need on time within a very short business cycle. So it's very interesting times ahead in terms of uh, challenges for engineers. That's just a picture of New Delhi, uh, it, 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 one of the three fastest growing cities in the world, uh, 20 million people. So it illustrates the challenge we face in terms of infrastructure, which is needed in these huge urban areas. Another picture from New Delhi, traffic congestion will be a huge, huge challenge in the future. 
we, we will need to figure out ways to keep the cities moving and obviously we're going to have to formulate solutions to address problems like this where uh, time loss, accidents and uh, uh, fuel wastage are, will be a huge problem unless they're addressed. Uh, this is one of the solutions we're looking at Nasdaq Sustainable City in the United Arab Emirates. It's a sustainable intelligent city, solar powered, uh, sustainable pod cars based on solar powered and uh, recycling of water, enabling uh, massive savings in terms of water usage, only one third of the normal water usage of a normal Middle Eastern city. So really do that represents a prototype in terms of where we need to go in future, in terms of sustainable urban development. Who's going to do this work? Well, the, I've put there the 21st century engineer uh, and Ireland delivering global engineering services. There's a real opportunity for Ireland here in terms of being a player and delivering these services into the future. Uh, we probably need to think about uh, the type of skills that engineers are going to need, not just the classic engineering skills, but also the soft skills like communications and uh, presentation skills and an ability to work within multidisciplinary teams, which uh, will be a feature of the future. Uh, just in terms of projects and to, to, to stay on the team of urbanization, uh, even developed countries like the US are experiencing further urbanization. The cities between Boston and Washington DC uh, will experience an increase from 50 million people within this mega region to 70 million people with, within, within the coming decades. So there, there's a need for more efficient public transport systems into mega cities like New York. So in terms of the long distance journeys, like from 400 to 600 meter range, which is normally accommodated by airline travel, we're, they're looking at high speed rail systems, Amtrak Northeast high speed rail system, which will be brought in on a phased basis over the next 35 years. It will deliver travel saving times from eight hours between Boston and Washington DC to three hours, 15 minutes. So uh, these public transport systems, high quality, will enable a modal shift from airline travel and car travel towards these high quality public trains. In terms of the cities like New York, we're, we're, the, the solutions in terms of for these high density urban areas, uh, the Bank of America Tower is a very good example. With a, it's, it, it'll be key in bringing, in bringing globally mobile professionals to cities like New York or Vancouver or Sydney uh, the, the urban fabric and the high quality infrastructure will be key to attracting these globally mobile professionals which I just mentioned there on the previous slide. Uh, this Bank of America tower incorporates high quality uh, light and air based on higher ceilings and floor to ceiling windows, grey water recycling system to reuse the water and an on-site mega plant. Moving further south, um, countries like Latin America are thinking about clean energy, but it's, it's, it's based on the 100-year-old hydroelectric power principle. This is a picture of Etapu Hydroelectric Dam on the Brazil-Paraguayan border. I was there about a year ago, and it, this project was commissioned in the 1980s on a phased basis, and it now supplies 20% of Brazil's electricity and 70% of Paraguay's electricity. So countries like Brazil and Indonesia will be making further developments in the hydroelectric field in the future. It's clean energy, it's, it's uh, as, as the same as solar, but obviously there'll be challenges in terms of land acquisition for reservoirs, uh, given, I suppose, people's greater awareness of rights in terms of their, their land rights, etc., which, which, which uh, is something that engineers are going to have to deal with in, 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 the, in the modern context. Um, just moving to the Middle East, this is King Abdullah Economic City. It will, it's been built at the cost of 93 billion, pe 93 billion euros. Um, it will accommodate 2 million people and will be, will be commissioned in 2030, presumably on a phased basis. And it, it will incorporate intelligent buildings, such as those skyscrapers, which you can see in the picture there. Uh, they will incorporate um, intelligent features like sensor technology to detect energy use and to detect uh, uh, traffic congestion, which will enable uh, greater efficiencies in terms of energy use and uh, and uh, movement of people into these city, cities based on efficient public transport systems. Back to Mastar then, as I said, it's, uh, it's, it represents uh, a pioneering project in terms of solar power and also cars, car, um, cars which are powered by solar power and also it has the water recycling feature and, and some other features as well. This is a wind tower in Mastar City. It uh, is designed to cool the, out, the outdoor temperature by 15 degrees, which will, uh, which which for hot climate countries, uh, cities in hot climates, this will be very important in terms of quality of life, particularly for those globally mobile professionals. 
this wind tower enables a hot, a cool climate in a hot country, uh, in, an, in an external environment. So it's a very important piece of technology. Master City Knowledge Center, it's a solar powered building. Intelligent design, all the solar cells are facing towards the sun uh, at, at, at all times of the day based on the porcupine like shape. So it's a, an intelligent design feature to maximize the solar harvest during the day. That's just a picture from a square in Master City. Obviously, you can see it's aesthetically appealing and uh, will obviously contribute to a higher quality of life in these cities and uh, attract the, 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 the relevant professions, which, as I said, will be needed to, to drive economic growth and development and research in these cities. These are the automatic solar cars in Master City, powered by solar energy and uh, automatically uh, driven by and following a guidance system embedded in the concrete uh, pavement surface there. That's the, the, the car moving along the pavement surface and uh, moving into the outer station of Mastar City. That's just another picture of the car and then that's just another picture of the car there. So uh, these, the, the, I think these, these uh, motor vehicles or solar powered automatic motor vehicles could present an opportunity in cities like Dublin or Cork or, or London in terms of transport for one to two kilometre journeys within the central city area. Cars could be removed from these areas. That's certainly the plan with un, under the Dublin City Council transport plan, which, which will aim to facilitate public transport, walking and cycling within the city core area, and cars circulating around the orbital routes. But these pod cars could op offer a solution in terms of shorter journeys, maybe for vulnerable uh, road users or older people. And some mass star cities, some recent visitors, you've got Angela Merkel from Germany. Uh, obviously, the Germans probably don't need much instruction in terms of science and technology. They're masters at it, and this explains their strong economic growth. Also, you have a picture of Hillary Clinton there, the former U.S. Secretary of State. And uh, obviously, the Americans have, uh, since the 1980s, have a focus on the financial services sector. But with the downturn and the problems associated with that sector, they're now talking about science and technology again. They're, they're even talking about an American re renaissance in production. So they're thinking very hard about science technology. Um, and these are politicians, so they're interested in things like jobs and protecting the environment. And I think engineers have a key role to play here in terms of promoting jobs to these, uh, uh, promoting science technology uh, options to create jobs, to protect the environment, to deliver energy use, and to deliver higher quality of life in cities. I think we, we'd, we'd get a very receptive ear if we're, if we're undertaking this research and communicating it at all levels of society, including to our politicians. So that's an important point. Back to Ireland. Well, we've got a tar target of 16% uh, renewable energy by 2020 on, uh, under the EU targets. We're only at 9% at the minute. We've hit 40% of our electricity is now generated by mainly by onshore wind energy. The problem is that electricity only makes up 20% of the overall mix, with cars and heating making up 80%. So we're going to have to think about things like um, charge points and motorways for e-cars. This has been planned at a euro-wide level. So uh, this will address the issue of um, uh, a journey concern in terms of a battery recharge for e-car users. And this is something we're going to have to make inroads, inroads into fairly soon to meet those targets. Just in terms of the uh, uh, back to the digital or intelligent factory, as I mentioned before, we came through the first industrial revolution, mechanization, second industrial revolution, mass production, third industrial revolution, and, uh, partial automation, and now moving into fourth industrial revolution, cyber physical systems, which will, com which will enable communication between machines and products and machines, uh, and the, the, the enabling a dynamic network of production within factories. Just to discuss that in more detail, total integrated automation is one of the more important uh, control systems that have been developed by companies like Siemens. Uh, there's, we, we're looking at a dynamic network factory which will self-optimize itself in terms of production run options. And it will, previously in the past we had uh, design drawings and then a production process. We now have two more process, two more stages within, in between those two, pro, two stages. One is a digital or virtual runs of the production run, which will enable a, a digital model of the production run itself to be produced and will, will, will provide data as to how the products turned out based on this virtual run in advance of the production run. 
uh, if, if, for instance, 10% of the products are turn out to be defective or with, with, with errors based on the virtual run or, or, or based on the data, you can then redesign or reconfigure your production run to aim for zero defects. So th th this is a very important um, uh, system in terms of facilitating zero defects on production runs and uh, facilitating uh, control of the entire supply chain from supply stage through to production through to uh, market user data. It will all feed into the dynamic network factory for, for to enable maximum op optimization of the production process. Uh, energy use, it will enable energy use savings, which will be very important in terms of cost competitiveness as well. And obviously, we're, we're, as mentioned, we're, these huge markets in urban areas and the fast growth of ICT will require a flexible production, which can adapt quickly to changes within the market. We're also looking at products which will be essentially self-intelligent. It will be communicating with machines and will, will, will have their own production details incorporated on a barcode on the product itself. So the challenges for the future are developing things like rule frameworks for the self-optimization process, presumably linked to things like quality and design issues. Uh, so the self-optimized program within factories will take place within this rule framework in terms of quality standards and, and other issues. You'll also be dealing with things like the type of vocabularies or languages which need to be developed for, for machine to machine and product to machine communication. And there will also be dynamic architect, architecture solutions, which, which will be the, uh, the, the digital solutions to enable rapid reconfiguration of production lines um, if market changes or if data is coming in from a supplier, which requires re-optimization of the production run. Then, then uh, staying on the, on the same team in terms of uh, intelligent infrastructure, and we're looking at more traffic, more fluctuating power from renewable energy sources and rising energy costs. So uh, the, the, the solutions being proposed by people like Thorsten Kleist, who I heard speaking at the, the FIDIC conference in Rio, are things like virtual power, uh, local grids of, of, of wind and solar energy supplying uh, the cities, but it will be based on what they're calling a hybrid grid. So part of the power coming from the main grid, national grid, and part of it from these local virtual power points. Uh, so the, um, most CEOs, about 63% of CEOs, agree that uh, the hybrid grid is the way things are developing in terms of energy use. We're also looking at, again at the total building solutions in terms of energy savings, costs, and things like driverless trains, cities like Paris, which enable closer running of trains, which enable greater capacity during morning peak and evening peak periods. And at the forefront of these developments in the digital factory and intelligent city is the inf information communications revolution or evolution. If you want to merge it in with the third industrial revolution, uh, the, the CEO of Hewlett Packard has stated that there'll be 30 billion internet devices by 2020. Uh, there'll be sensor networks for building roads, as I've mentioned. And uh, in terms of the key ICT players, well, Intel Eastlip is a good example. It's one of the top three in the world. Um, it, 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 it is moving towards a slight error there. It's moving towards 40 nanometer chip production based on its recent 4 billion upgrade to the plant at, at uh, Leaslip. And also Hewlett Packard Leaslip is it started with printing technology and now is the number one provider of IT services in uh, the Republic of Ireland, particularly to a lot of government agencies and obviously businesses. So the key developments here in the ICT sector are things like cloud services to cope with the huge growth in data volume over the last uh, 15 or 20 years, and also the, 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 the matter of virtualization. The growing complexity of data combined with the growing power of computers meant that computers were becoming too cumbersome to deal with the complex data. So instead of using a, a sledgehammer to break a nut, these computers are broken down into virtual computers. A large computer server could be broken down into five or 10 smaller servers, virtual servers, to deal with complex data issues and can be reconfigured over time. So just summing up, uh, technology is the key solution uh, for the key challenges of the future, which is global hyper growth around the world, mass urbanization, and, and, and uh, a huge challenge in terms of supplying energy, water, transport systems, food, and all and the other factors which ensure a quality of life in cities for the future. The challenge is to deliver 
a better quality of life for 7 billion people in cities by 2060, 2070. And uh, the solution will be sustainable high-density cities like New York, compact, high-density, served by high-quality public transport systems. Uh, so we're also going to consider things like a national grid, a hybrid grid, the national power grid combined with local wind and solar energy power points. And uh, we're, we're, we're obviously looking at things like flexible production in terms of uh, uh, production tailored towards the, the market and taking account of things like changes in the supply chain or changes at market level. So that's very important for the future. And just to sum up, engineers', engineers role in the future, uh, just to conclude with uh, the largest urban area in the world, which is Tokyo, 35 million people. Engineers' role is to deliver a quality of life for 7 billion people by uh, 2070. So here's two views of Tokyo. One shows uh, congestion on the Tokyo subway in the morning and the other shows uh, a much uh, brighter photo of people enjoying themselves uh, on a day out in Tokyo. And when I initially made this presentation in the colleges, I, I obviously contrasted the first photo as a picture of what, what a bad urban uh, um, situation might look like in the future unless we address them and then the photo on the right would be considered like a, a positive urban situation based on implementation of efficient science and technology but as I, as I thought about it more uh, I think both photos probably reflect the, the urban future and the urban century that we're going to live in in the future uh, part of the reason why people I think are attracted to the cities like the, the 1920s poster which I showed you earlier is, is the fact that this uh, the, the dynamism and the, the activity of cities and uh, the, the density of social contacts which enables such a range of opportunities for people living in cities. So, uh, but alongside that, people also need their own private space. So there's, a, I think, an urban tension uh, that people learn to live with in cities in terms of the acceptable levels of congestion or inconvenience. And I suppose our role as engineers in the future will be to produce... Uh, and to create urban areas with engineering services which, which have an acceptable level of convenience or con inconvenience or congestion, which I think people are prepared to live with for, for, the, benefits, uh, to, to, for the benefits of living in, within an urban area. So look, that's the talk on the urban century. Uh, anybody who's listening in, I, I hope you've taken, uh, uh, I hope you found it to be an interesting uh, perspective on urban development in the future and the whole new range of technologies which are coming on screen. I think it's very important that we as engineers research these trends. Uh, I've certainly published a number of articles over the last five years on engineering in different parts of the world that I've travelled to, places like India, the Middle East and Brazil there last year and Canada. So I think it's very important that we research these trends and communicate them at all levels of society in our schools, colleges and libraries and other and to our politicians. Uh, engineers really can offer solutions for the future in terms of science technology delivering economic growth, sustainability and environmental protection. So thank you for taking the time to listen in and uh, I, you can contact me uh, at, at any stage uh, in the future if you wish to ask me any questions. I, I've just left up my uh, contact details there and if anybody wants to take the contact details and email me at, at any stage, you're welcome to do so. so Thank you for your time and attention. I, I can be contacted in Kildare National Roads Office in NACE uh, as well if, at, at 045-988-905. Hopefully you've had the opportunity to take down some of the details there. But I can, I can be contacted in Kildare National Roads Office in NACE. If anybody has any further questions, please feel free to come back to me. Thank you very much for your time and attention.